all for joining us. Um, we're sorry we missed you in December. Um, it was an absolutely busy month for many of us. We had some Hunter Education classes going on, trying to flex some days off because of Christmas and enjoying some time with our families as remote as we were. But um, thank you guys for bearing with us and joining us again this year. So um, a couple of housekeeping. Um, if you'll just stay on mute while our presenters are presenting, we would definitely appreciate that. And then, like I said, there will be time for some questions and answers. Um, feel free to throw things in the chat. So if you guys have some cool recipes that you found after our last lady social hour or um, you know, want, want to share some great information or successes that you had over the last six months or six weeks, um, feel free to throw that in the chat so we can continue that conversation as well. But um, for those of you who are new or um, are returning, um, I'm Tristana Bickford. I am the department's communications director. I am based out of the Santa Fe office and happily working from my house right now. So <laughs> I, I love telecommuting, so I, I will keep on doing this. But I want to um, introduce our other panelists, and then we will introduce our special guest tonight. Um, she's been with us before, um, but we're going to talk about a little bit different topic than we talked about last time she was on. So um, Jennifer, Megan, Jessica, do you guys want to introduce yourselves? Sure, I'll, I'll go ahead. Um, I'm Jennifer Morgan and welcome everybody. Happy New Year. It's so wonderful to see everybody and start the near, new year off with, with you guys. And, um, but I'm the Hunter Education Program Coordinator with the agency and normally based out of the Albuquerque office, but I am now based out of home. <laughs> so um, anyway, I will pass the baton off to Megan. Good evening, everybody. My name is Megan Otero, and I am the assistant coordinator for Hunter Education. And I also am normally based out of the Albuquerque office, um, right now based out of uh, my house in Rio Rancho. So uh, welcome, everybody. And I'm Jessica Fisher. I'm the shooting program coordinator for the department. And um, I normally out of the Santa Fe office, um, I'm working from home. I am not as happy about it as Tristana is and cannot <laughs> wait until we can go back to the office. And mostly because I think um, so much of what I do and Jennifer and Megan probably would agree is that um, we do a lot of interacting with uh, people in, in our education jobs and, and we miss that in-person education opportunities, but we're making the best of Zoom. Um, it's <laughs> It's been a new challenge for us, and and uh, and I'm also right now um, helping answer the phones with the department. So if you call and want to apply for the draw, you might get lucky and get to talk to me. And uh, so, welcome and back to you, T. <laughs> Perfect. And we do want to get to know all you guys. Um, I'm hoping that we'll have a few more people joining in. So if you don't mind, throw it in the chat and let us know where you're from. Um, but our special guest tonight is Caitlin Rule, and she's going to be talking about the department's Bighorn Sheep program. Um, it, it's, I think it's a really unique opportunity whenever I get to see Bighorn Sheep. And when I get to talk to Caitlin and her colleague, Eric, about the Bighorn Sheep program, I'm always wowed by the information that that they have um, and I'm pretty excited that she gets to share that information with you guys today. Um, she did join us, I can't remember, October, November and talked about ice fishing. So if you missed that, make sure and check out the YouTube link and learn a bit about it. Um, I know she just said she was up there over the weekend doing some ice fishing. Um, so, you know, there's always a great time to, to go enjoy that or go fishing somewhere else in the state. But um, Caitlin, I'll let you take over and introduce yourself and teach us about Bighorn Sheep in New Mexico. Hey, right. um, so I'm Caitlin, I, one of our two bighorn sheep biologists in New Mexico, and I have been working for the department and residing in New Mexico for about seven years now. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's been a few months since I met with you all, but do have to report that I've been up to Eagle Nest ice fishing a few times this week. It's been really awesome. So uh, I encourage anybody to get out there whether you've tried it or not yet, um, it's pretty fun out on the ice as long as it's not too windy. So it's, it's a good year, especially for perch. We struck out on trout, but um, all right, share screen here, get the talk started. All right, so 
like I said, based out of Santa Fe, but we actually have some sheep populations all over the state. So I am fortunate in that I get to see uh, many of the beautiful landscapes in New Mexico, both in desert country and uh, high alpine habitat. One thing I've been amazed about since since I came to New Mexico and started in this job is how many people I encounter out in the public that don't even realize we have bighorn sheep in the state. So my hope is that uh, after today, uh, you can all help us to get the word about, out about the fact that there are bighorn sheep and what their story is. The title of this talk is An Evolving Tale of Perseverance. And I think this really characterizes their story in New Mexico. Um, and their past, present, and future. You know, they've really been, they've really been dynamic over the last century. And while they're pretty stable right now, they are still quite vulnerable to decline in years to come. And, and you'll learn a little bit about why in the slides ahead. Real quick outline. I plan to go over a little bit of history about bighorn sheep in New Mexico, and then uh, talk about some of the monitoring and management that we do, and a little bit about recreation. So this, uh, this map here shows the historic distribution of bighorn sheep throughout North America. And if you look there in 1850, you can see uh, how widespread they really were. And estimates are a little bit iffy, but some some postulate that at one point there were over a million bighorn sheep uh, across North America. Unfortunately, by the mid 20th century, that was down to an estimated 30,000. Happy to report that we're doing better today and they're at least represented in a lot more habitat uh, than they were 80 years ago, but they probably still number 80 to 90,000, just a, a small fraction really of what they were historically. We have a lot of great support for their for uh, historical presence in New Mexico, probably the oldest dating back to a thousand years ago as they're represented in some artwork um, from the Mogollon culture in New Mexico. They're in that Mimbris Bowl and also on that, that petroglyph. If you ever get the chance, I encourage you to visit Three Rivers Petroglyph site and check out the bighorn sheep and uh, numerous other amazing drawings there. We also know that they were present in the 1500s. They were documented by uh, Coronado in his expedition across New Mexico. Their evidence, there's evidence of their presence in the 1800s, um, given records of market hunters that actually brought uh, various bighorn sheep carcasses uh, to markets from Southwest New Mexico. And then James Ohio Patty documented them in the mid 1800s as well. So why the decline? And this is kind of the story throughout North America and certainly in New Mexico, but the decline in bighorn sheep was primarily due to two reasons. And that is unregulated hunting, meat hunting for sure, and livestock grazing. And that livestock grazing had multiple Effects really. And one was simply direct competition with bighorn sheep. Probably the biggest component was disease transmission from livestock to bighorn sheep. But they also worked to alter the landscape, kind of changing fire regimes and altering habitat uh, to this day. Real quick, for those of you who don't know, we actually have two subspecies of bighorn in New Mexico and that's both Rocky Mountain and desert. Their differences are honestly at times imperceptible. Uh, generally Rocky Mountain bighorn are, are bigger. Their uh, coats get a lot thicker in the winter. One thing with ewes I, I can tell on between desert and Rocky Mountain bighorn is those ewe, desert bighorn ewes have much longer horns. Um, if you see in that trail camera picture for desert bighorn, the two sheep front and center are both used and, and we assume that that's a, a method of heat dissipation, having those longer horns. 
So with that in mind, I plan to kind of go over the history of both of them separately, like at the same time, but keep them separate because they do have two di very different stories. In the early 1900s, there was maybe as many as 300 desert bighorn in the hatchets, 100 observed in the Guadalupes, and sheep were also known to occur in San Andres Mountains. <clears throat> There's records of desert bighorn in the Sacramentos in the 1930s. However, by 1946, the only known desert bighorn populations were in the San Andres, that's on the White Sands Missile Range, and in the Hatchet Mountains, which is in our boot heel region of New Mexico. Shifting quick to Rocky Mountain bighorn, by the early 1900s, they were actually completely extirpated from New Mexico. We began restoration efforts on Rockies in the 1930s, actually, and we did that with Rockies in part because there were some available from Canada. Uh, the initial attempts were not successful, but by the mid 1940s, there was a population established first in the Sandias. Moving on to the second half of the 20th century, uh, 1960s, we were able to establish some additional Rocky Mountain bighorn populations in the Pecos, the Turkey Creek area, and San Francisco River. A decade later, we had some transplants done in the Wheeler and Latir, trying to restore Rocky Mountain bighorn there. Unfortunately, this work coincided with some summer grazing of domestic sheep, and uh, as a result of disease, few, if any, of those big horns survived that. A couple decades later, we finally established another population in Wheeler Peak. During that same time frame, we began the Red Rock Propagation Program. And so we actually set up a captive facility uh, north of Lordsburg, New Mexico. And that has proven to be one of the greatest ideas, I think, in, in New Mexico conservation. This allowed us to raise some captive sheep in order to restore them out into unoccupied habitat. So unfortunately though, by 1980, even though we still had desert bighorn, they were listed as state endangered with about 70 remaining in the state. Sheep from that Red Rock facility were used to restart a population in the Pelencios. And then a couple decades later, another population in the Ladrones near Socorro. Kind of side note here in this middle bar, I've added um, some slightly tangential but important points. And in 1990, we established an enhancement fund for bighorn sheep through, through auctioning a, a tag every year. Now in the last couple decades, We've established additional populations for both for both deserts and Rockies uh, on the desert side, in the Fra Cristobals, in the Caballos, uh, and also the Sacramentos. Some kind of highlights in the desert story are um, beginning a line removal program in 2001 as a management tool to help increase bighorn sheep populations. It was kind of cool. We actually had one desert bighorn herd start all on its own. Um, they moved into the Caballo Mountains from the Fras and, and got a foothold. We were able to bring one transplant there and they've really done well. By 2008, we were able to downlist from state endangered to state threatened. And by 2011, desert bighorn were finally delisted. And then, uh, continue to increase the number of populations as well as uh, abundance within herds on the Rocky Mountain Bighorn side with additions to the Rio Grande Gorge, the Tier, and the Jemez. So here's where we stand today. The yellow bullets are all of our Rocky Mountain Bighorn populations and the blue are desert for the most part Deserts are in the south, with the exception of that Gila country, the San Francisco River and Turkey Creek, we have Rocky Mountain Bighorn there. And that is simply an artifact of 
us putting Rocky Mountain bighorn there. Most likely those were deserts historically. Um, our desert population is a little over a thousand and the Rocky Mountain bighorn population is upwards of 1500 across the state. This is just a real quick look at some of the trends over the last two decades or so. If you were to back this up, uh, the Rocky Mountain Bighorn line kind of undulates similarly to, to how it is here uh, for the past couple of decades. Well, the deserts have just steadily increased. So moving on to kind of the management and monitoring portion of the talk. The name of the game in, in bighorn sheep restoration has really been trapping and translocating, uh, whether it be by net gun or drop net. It has been a key component to our success in restoring bighorn in New Mexico. There's a look at the numbers. Uh, in New Mexico alone, we've transplanted upwards of 70, 80 times um, for both deserts and Rockies. And we're talking about thousands of sheep to get us to where we are today. And westwide, there's been more than 20,000 sheep transplanted uh, since the 1920s. like to focus a little bit on just desert bighorn here. And I talked about kind of the zoomed out look at, at the population trends. And you can see that here for desert bighorn. Um, I'll remind you in 1980, we were listed as state endangered for that subspecies. Uh, as you can see, we're really happy with where we are today comparatively. But there's really an inflection point around the 2000s. Um, those yellow bars you see are, that represents the number of bighorn sheep that were transplanted within that year to give you an idea of, of the uh, intensity of restoration efforts. But that inflection point, while certainly explained by, by transplants, we think is also due to another management tool that we've implemented. And that is lion control. And we started range-wide lion control just within desert bighorn mountain ranges in 2001. Prior to doing that, we, had, we were having a mortality rate of 17% on, on radio collared bighorn sheep, and those are all adults. But after implementing lion control, that decreased to 5%. Um, we also know that their overall mortality rate uh, decreased, you know, was par paralleled that. So it wasn't that lines were compensating for mortality that would otherwise occur. I'm a really visual person. So that's why I put the, the figure up here. Uh, it gives you a good idea of what those rates actually mean. With more than three and 20 dying on that higher rate and just one and 20 on that lower one. So here's that same graph, but I actually uh, overlaid what our line removal efforts have looked like. And so this is something we still use as a management tool, pretty much entirely within our desert bighorn populations, though not all of them. And uh, it, it probably comes out to about three lines removed per range per year. But we really, really do credit both that program as well as the transplants with the continued success of that desert bighorn population statewide. So one topic at the forefront really of bighorn management throughout the West and in New Mexico too, is the issue of disease. And when we're talking about disease in bighorn sheep, we're primarily worried about uh, pneumonia or respiratory disease. And this typically initially results from a contact event with domestic sheep. 
But then, of course, bighorn can transmit disease to each other. There's a wide range of consequences, and we see varying levels of morbidity, mortality, with a median decline of 48% in herds that have these respiratory disease outbreaks. Long-term effects can be chronic low lamb survival. We've documented pneumonia events historically in the Wheeler, Latir, and Palencios, for sure. Uh, a little more recently in San Francisco, in San Andres herds, and most recently in the Fra Cristobal's in Rio Grande Gorge. Um, the Fra's, we saw a disease outbreak in 2018 and had about a 15% decline in our, in our radio collared animals that year. Uh, some good news to report this year on our, our survey, we saw some of the highest lamb numbers that we've seen there. So um, hopefully the strain that they had isn't, um, isn't going to have this, these really bad long-term chronic low lamb recruitment levels. In the Rio Grande Gorge, this is uh, the most recent disease outbreak and, and this was in just this past year in 2020. Um, we've got about 30 radio collared animals there and fortunately none of them uh, have, have died due to disease. But our surveys are showing us that there's been a little bit lower lamb recruitment this year. So um, we'll, we'll have to see what's to come on the recruitment front. But given that we had pretty high adult survival, where fingers are crossed that this won't be, um, you know, a death sentence for that herd. <clears throat> and so respiratory disease has been really a long time issue. You know, I talked about that being one of the reasons sheep declined in the early 20th century. Um, you know, for decades, it's plagued bighorn sheep restoration efforts. And it's frankly puzzled a lot of bighorn sheep researchers because it turns out it's probably polymicrobial in that there's not necessarily only one bug to blame. That said, in recent years, they found that that one bacteria um, has, has really been the primary pathogen in causing these really bad disease outbreak events. And that is mycoplasma ova pneumonia, we call it MOV for short. And when sheep, bighorn sheep get infected with this bacteria, the outcome can be variable. Um, it might depend a little bit on that strain of bacteria. It might depend on what other bacteria are present within those individuals host resistance, and then even other environmental factors that might um, be stressing that bighorn herd out. We do know that in 100% of populations affected by pneumonia, um, MOVI was present, while most that were unaffected by pneumonia, MOVI was not. So that kind of lends itself to support this idea that this MOVI is, is really the, the primary culprit in some of these big outbreaks. When it comes down to it, the best strategy to, to keep our herd safe is separation between domestic sheep and bighorn sheep. Um, you know, once, once you get it, it's, there's, there's not a great solution at this point, really. We've seen some, some states have resorted to basically removing entire bighorn sheep herds and then restoring with new, new clean sheep that don't have MOVI. Um, some recent research, research is finding that if you, if you remove, some animals might be chronic shedders of that bacteria. And so if you remove those animals, that, uh, that can actually help the health of that population. Um, so you know, hopefully, hopefully we continue that research and that becomes, that seems like a better option than than removing an entire herd, but it's tricky once you get it. So separation is key. At this point in New Mexico, we know the bug is present in the San Andres, the Fra Cristobals, the Ladrones, the Caballos, and now the Rio Grande Gorge. This is really a hot topic in bighorn sheep, in the bighorn sheep world. Um, if you're interested in this topic at all, or even if you're not, even if you're just interested in seeing, you know, cool scenery and, and great wildlife video, 
I encourage you to check out this movie, Wild and Wool. It's less than half an hour. Um, if you just YouTube that, uh, you should be able to find it. It's about Hell's Canyon, Bighorn in Idaho, and um, really puts into perspective kind of the severity of the disease issue for bighorn sheep. Lastly, I just want to talk briefly about um, recreational opportunities for bighorn sheep. Unfortunately, with so few animals, uh, especially compared to a lot of our other big game species, there's not a lot of hunting opportunity. That has increased in recent years uh, due to some expanded ewe hunts, and that has helped people kind of get out on the mountains and experience sheep hunting. Um, but it's it's otherwise a very unique and rare hunting opportunity. Eight of our 10 Rocky Mountain Bighorn herds are hunted. And this, in 2019-2020, that, that meant only 27 ram licenses went out in pretty similar numbers for Desert Bighorn. But those ewe hunts in Rocky Mountain Bighorn have provided another opportunity there. These are for anybody who's who's interested in um, big rams. Here's just some photos of some of the best rams that we've seen taken by hunters in recent years. Um, you know, I think I think anybody that, that walks away successful from a bighorn sheep hunt is proud of their trophy, but here's just some, some great shots that we got in recent years, both desert and Rocky Mountain bighorn. Uh, another way to, to experience bighorn and the more likely way most of us get to experience bighorn is through viewing opportunity. And there are a few places around the state where you can view bighorn, probably the easiest and, and one of the best is that Rio Grande Gorge herd outside of Taos. <clears throat> These pictures were taken from New Mexico magazine. Um, the photographer did an outstanding job, but it's yeah, it's pretty spectacular. You can just park at the high bridge and walk north or south with some binoculars or maybe not even binoculars and, and still catch some sheep moving on the rim. If you want to see desert bighorn, probably the best place to go is the Sacramento's outside of Alamogordo. If you check out that New Mexico Magazine article, we list a, a few more options. And if you're really interested, please send me an email and I'll help help guide you to some places to view bighorn. And with that, uh, just a couple links there and in, in my contact info, if you have any questions um, or comments on bighorn sheep in New Mexico and hopefully you have a little bit of time to just um, chat with everybody. Let me know if, if this sparked any ideas or thoughts. Hey, Caitlin. Yeah, we had a great question from Elizabeth Milford um, in our chat. Um, I just kind of touched on it, but I would like for you to give a, a little bit more expanded answer. But she was asking with all the transplants, is there any work on making sure the populations are genetically diverse? That's yeah, that is a great question. Um, we were especially worried about this with desert bighorn, given that a vast majority of our desert bighorn came from that captive facility. And so they did a genetic analysis in the early 2000s and it did show uh, lower genetic diversity than we were hoping for. And this really is an issue. Um, it it kind of gets backseat compared to disease, um, but it really is something that we need to think about for their, their long-term sustainability. Uh, given the results in the early 2000s on that Red Rock herd, we did bring in some rams from Mexico um, to introduce some new genes into, into that captive herd. And um, we haven't really done an analysis on Rocky Mountain Bighorn uh, that's on our minds for sure, though. And um, yeah, great point. We've got one more uh, question, Caitlin, from Julie Metters. Uh, her question is, will they ever be reintroduced back into the Guadalupe Mountains? She imagines that they won't as there's so many Barbary sheep. 
Yeah, uh, there's no plans for doing that right now. We do have Barbary sheep in the sacks too. Um, we don't quite know the intricacies of the interaction and competition between Barbary and bighorn sheep. So far that herd in the sack seems to be doing well. Um, the hunting paradigm for Barbary is a little bit different in that area and that it's over the counter. So, so we know they get um, a lot of hunting pressure and, and that was by design with the idea of going there with bighorn at some point. So they were historically present in the Guadalupe's uh, as you saw, but right now there's not any plans there. I, I think there's a few uh, flocks of domestic sheep too, kind of close to the Guadalupe's that are on our radar. Um, and so we generally, generally try not to start hers right where we know there's some grazing domestic sheep. But yeah, follow up to that, I'm happy to go on. One thing I want to add to Caitlin's conversation is um, a lot, she was talking about the um, Red Rock uh, area and um, if you've never had an opportunity to see that, a lot of think, people think that captive is, is something that you think of as very a small area, but the, the Red Rock uh, wildlife area is a huge area that uh, does very, very well for our desert bighorn sheep. So it, it's, it's not just this tiny little pin where we have uh, bighorn sheep that are very used to people. They are wild and, and it's an amazing facility. Yeah, they're good point. Yep, they are certainly wild and and you know one point that people sometimes bring up is is um, well maybe that's not fair since since they're within a fence that they haven't experienced uh, predators and so then releasing them could be problematic from that perspective. But we actually do get mountain lions in that pen at least once, if not twice a year. So. Um, they actually are, are very experienced with predators and and compare they I'm not sure when it was in the last few decades, but they actually compared uh, predation rates on radio collared sheep that came from Red Rock versus from wild populations. Actually, sheep that were transplanted to a new area and came from wild populations had higher predation rates. So um, we're, we're pretty sure that we're supported in saying that that is not an issue for restored bighorn sheep coming from the captive facility. Caitlin, is the Red Rock facility open to the public for any type of viewing? Uh, it's not open in the sense that you can walk in there, but some of it is viewable from outside of the enclosure. Um, I wouldn't guarantee that you'd be able to see sheep if you went there, um, but it's possible. And, and one more thing, can you back up one slide and show that um, gorge, the gorge slide one more time picture? Because what I find most fascinating about this is that there are sheep down there in the gorge and then there are sheep way up there in those, those peaks, those snow-capped peaks. Yes. Um, the diversity of lifestyle terrain that they live in is just, it blows my mind. Um, we've, the de as a department, we, you know, did a kind of a field trip to go take the chairlift um, in the summertime up to the tippy top of the world there and, and got to see the, the sheep up on top of the mountain as well. Caitlin, we've got another question from Colleen. Um, whoop, let me get back up in the chat here to, to read it. Um, I can't see her. I would say that she could unmute herself. Um, Colleen, why don't you go ahead, if you can, unmute yourself. I got lost in the chat. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes. Um, my question was if there was going to be continued plans or future plans to continue some predator management in those uh, bighorn population areas. Yes, we, we continue to use that as a tool in most of our desert bighorn populations. So most of our Rocky Mountain bighorn populations, there's no predator removal because uh, it's not really a limiting factor for those Rockies, especially the alpine ones. Um, the gorge, 
mountain lion predation isn't a problem. Some of the other lower elevation Rocky Mountain populations, it can become a problem, but we haven't um, had any lion removal this year on those. But yes, it is a, a continued, we plan to continue using that tool with most of our desert bighorn herds. Um, it's not implemented in the San Andres right now. And it's kind of been a modified design in the frock crystal balls where they actually had a bunch of mountain lions collared. And so only mountain lions that reached a certain threshold of um, preying on bighorn sheep were removed. But yeah, we, we plan to continue that uh, as long as it's permitted, I, I guess would be one way to say it. I know it's not entirely palatable to folk, um, but it really seems like the only way, if, if our goal is to keep increasing desert bighorn sheep um, and protect them from, from some catastrophic losses, it, it's proven to work so far. Caitlin, is there any interaction between deserts and Rockies? There could be, uh, let me go back to my map. So we don't, they can breed. They, uh, you can end up with hybrid um, desert Rockies. We haven't documented that here in New Mexico, but we also haven't really specifically tested for it. Um, we had, let's see, that's way back here it is. So you can see there that Northernmost Blue Point is our northernmost desert herd in the Ladrones. And then just across the river basically is a rocky herd in Manzanos. You know, the terrain is a really a pretty good barrier to movement. It's just they don't like be, they don't like walking across flats. You know, they like sticking to really steep open stuff. So it's not likely that that sheep would travel that that uh, particular path, but it's not impossible. Um, we actually, interestingly, had a Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep show up in the San Andres Mountains, which are um, kind of just north of Las Cruces there, that really big mountain chain. We had a Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep show up there from Arizona. And so we knew that because it, it was ear tagged. It came from basically Arizona, kind of parallel in in latitude with that I-40 and worked its way down through the Gila, uh, north of Deming. We had reports of them north of Deming. We tried to get a crew out to, to um, at least put a GPS collar on those sheep at that point. But then they were documented. He was documented on a trail camera in the San Andres uh, this past year. So it seems very possible that we could have someday at some point mixing in New Mexico and I don't I don't really know if that would be a good or a bad thing you know it seems like uh, I guess a, a common um, I don't really want to say issue but quandary for uh, wildlife and, and fish managers really across the west this idea of you know lumping and splitting and but also genetic diversity is a good thing so um, hopefully we'll we'll be able to figure that out at some point here, but for now we haven't seen it happen. Anybody and that, that wasn't a beer, that's, it's a sparkling water. <laughs> <laughs> what other questions do you guys have about bighorn sheep? Um, feel free if you want to um, unmute and ask a question or type it into the chat and we can, we can ask that for you. I didn't really have a question about sheep. I um, have a 14-year-old a who is interested in learning how to hunt and I don't hunt. And so I got a uh, friend sent me the link for this. Um, as a way to try and find out how to get him set up with hunter education. It's probably way off topic. No, actually, that could be a perfect segue. Okay. <laughs> is that, is that is our next topic. Um, Caitlin, are you going to stick around or I, I know you have a family and, uh, and other stuff to do. Are you going to stick around or are you going to jump off? Yeah, I'm going to stick around for a little while. Okay, 
So if you guys have more questions, feel free to throw them in the chat. Oh, we have one more for you, Caitlin. Um, do you do you appreciate bighorn sheep sightings and uh, uh, do you receive bighorn sheep sightings and reports in real time? Um, yeah, we, we're we're always happy to hear about bighorn sheep sightings. Um, you know, obviously, if somebody says, "Oh, I saw ten rams at at um, you know the high bridge," that's that's something we really know about, and it wouldn't be a surprise. So, but that said, better safe than sorry. So, if anybody ever wants to report uh, seeing bighorn sheep somewhere, we're happy to hear it. I see that in the chat. Is it yeah. Cool? Do you guys collect photos and things like that for sightings or no? Like if you know the location? Yeah, yep. I okay. store all kinds of photos that people send to me. So, um, and sometimes even use them in presentations. So <laughs> we have, we're happy to get any feedback. Well, we'll jump on. Thank you, Caitlin, for um, coming and joining us. We definitely appreciate your time and your knowledge and sharing it with us. And um, even though I love working from home, I do miss walking down the hall and picking your brains and <laughs> learning more about what you guys do and to manage wildlife in New Mexico. So thanks for, thanks for your time. We appreciate it. Yeah, sure thing. And we'll jump over um, since Elizabeth gave us a perfect segue into our second topic for tonight. And Jennifer and Megan are going to talk a little bit about hunter education because it is definitely an important time to get hunter education um, before the big game drop. So go ahead, Jennifer. Yeah, that was an amazing segue. So thank you for that. <laughs> I, I do want to also introduce uh, the third member of our hunter education team. She was able to hop on. Her name is Rosalind Washington. Um, she's got a beautiful. Um, tree scenery virtual background but um, whenever she is able we can introduce her so you guys get to know the third member of our hunter education staff so but um yeah we will get right into kind of the ins and outs of hunter education and i i know it'll probably answer your question about getting your um any, any new hunter involved in um, on their way to becoming um a, a new young hunter. So that's really exciting, Elizabeth. So I'm glad you, you brought that up. So, so basically the biggest question we all get is who needs to have hunter education? So, oh, there's Rose really quick. So go ahead and Rose and introduce yourself to the, to the group. Oh, you're on mute. There you okay. Go. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Sorry, my picture. I'm not used to the laptop in the picture. I just look weird. Um, <laughs> Welcome everybody. Nice to meet everybody. I was running a little late. I couldn't log in, but now I'm here. Um, great intro. Um, I'm Hunter Education. I'm the one that answers everybody's calls and emails. Um, if you called me and emailed me, that's who it is. That's me. So, but I'm always available. You're welcome to call me if you have any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Rose. So basically here in New Mexico, hunter education is required for anybody under the age of 18. So a lot of folks say, well, anybody under 18, age 18? Yes, there is no minimum age here in New Mexico. So anybody can has an opportunity to participate in our hunter education courses. And of course, um, you know, take hunter education. Once you have it, it's, you're, you're good for, for life. And what's really cool is once you have your hunter education certification, um, it has reciprocity with all 50 states. So all 50 states recognize each other's certifications. So if you wanted to go to Arizona or Colorado or even Canada or Mexico to hunt, we recognize each other's hunter education certification. So um, that is another big question is, hey, I had hunter education in New Mexico and I wanna also apply for hunts in Colorado or Texas um do i have to take their course as well nope once you have it from a state and you're certified by that state then you are good in all 50 states canada and mexico so and we also have other countries that recognize hunter education certification so that's pretty cool so if you're under 18 you have to have hunter education and the other caveat to this is uh, if you're an adult and you want to apply for big game hunts that or you want to hunt 
on the military installations of McGregor or Fort Bliss. It doesn't matter how old you are, uh, you'll need to have hunter education as an adult on those properties as well. So it's super important that if you're going to look at maybe some of those Barbary sheep hunts, Oryx, I think antelope, and um, I think there are also um, some deer hunts on, on some of those military properties. Just make sure that you read up on their specific uh, regulations for hunter education, and then that way you're not caught on uh, by surprise. But we always recommend hunter education for anybody, um, regardless of age. You can never be too safe in the field, regardless of what type of method you're going to be using in the field, whether it's a firearm or a bow. And um, knowledge is power, and it, and it helps you because not only do we talk about firearm safety and responsibility, but we also talk about ethics and outdoor responsibility, uh, outdoor preparedness and survival, uh, wildlife conservation and wildlife identification. So it, it's a really well-rounded uh, um, educational opportunity for anybody to take that we highly recommend, regardless if, if you're a hunter now um, or you're looking into hunting or maybe you're just kind of looking into being a little more outdoorsy, um, anything, uh, there's a lot of stuff that you can take from a hunter education course. So the next thing that a lot of folks asked, ask us is, what are my course options? Well, currently, right now, we're a little challenged with COVID. So it is kind of had, to, we've had to adapt and evolve to some of these um, current situations that we're all living in. So Right now, we have had to postpone all of our in-person uh, educational opportunities across the board, whether it's hunter education or angler education or any of those in-person things that we all loved uh, to, to do and we everybody embraced. We've had to kind of change how we deliver these opportunities. And so for now, what the agency has done to prepare uh, folks, of course, for our upcoming uh, draw, which is March 17th. So if you're interested in putting in for hunts this year, it is Wednesday, March 17th by 5 p.m. So make sure you are not in the middle of applying at 4.50 because it will kick you out. So plan ahead, uh, do everything well in advance, and you shouldn't, you won't, shouldn't have any problems. And if you do, then you have more than enough time to, to get help and, and to get what you need. But the course options that we are, are available to folks right now is if you are a New Mexico resident, 10 and over, uh, we have three online course opportunities for those individuals. Um, so a couple of them are user pay, one is free, but those course options are available on the main Game and Fish website. So I want to do a little screen share right now so everybody is kind of in the know of where this happens to live on our website. So hopefully, um, if you give me a thumbs up somebody so I can see that everybody's seeing. Okay, thank you. So uh, where I am at right now is on the main Game and Fish website. People get this in our customer system confused. Um, they're both wonderful resources. You can find hunter education information on both, but this is a quick, easy one that you don't have to log into uh, to find the information that you need for hunter education. So on the main hunter education page, you'll find um, a couple of options here, uh, tabs, and at the top, we have our online options tab. So this is where you'll find information about the online courses that we have available. Um, these two are the user pay, and this one right here is free. A uh, little uh, quirky thing right now that we're working through for NRA is it is free. However, they haven't been able to change um, the minimum age on this. So I just want to notify everybody because I'm starting to get a lot of traffic about, hey, my, my child is 10 and I'm trying to take this free course and it's not letting me. Well, um, just due to some issues, this course is not available yet for those 10 and over. It's available at 11. That was the old age we had established for our online courses. So if your child or somebody that you know is 10 and over, um, these two course options are available for those 10 year olds. And then this free option is for 11. But this is where you find where those online options are available. They are through a third party provider. Uh, the content is, is the same, it's still recognized by all states, so don't think that, oh, if I take this online course, I still have to do something. Um, 
in person. No, once you receive your certification through these online course providers, you will earn your Hunter Education number. And what's nice is it's all standardized curriculum. Um, there's quizzes that you that the student needs to pass a final uh, a cumulative exam at the end, and then you can earn your Hunter Education number. And then that number is automatically uploaded into the student's customer account. So that's how those online courses work. Now, our next option is for students who are either of any age or don't meet that benchmark of 10 and over. So those are our younger ones, eight, nine years of age. And I'm seeing quite a bit of stuff about on the, in the chat right now about mentor youth and some of other things. So we can definitely get to that um, after I highlight these Hunter Education course options. So let's say you have a, a youngster who does not meet that uh, benchmark of 10. So we do offer our virtual courses we have some of those resources uh, in detail um, on our quick links. And that virtual opportunity is basically what we have in place uh, or have adapted for our instruct or in person. So it's still instructor led. Um, it is still in person, so to speak, but it's all virtually on Zoom. And with those particular courses, you register for those opportunities just as you would if you were going to actually come to a facility in person and take a course um, with our instructors. As you register for the virtual courses through this customer uh, account system or that CIN system, which you come uh, up here to the blue banner, you create your customer login with the agency. This is the same account that you utilize to purchase a license or apply for hunts. Um, each student needs to have their own customer login. Once you're in your account, you find Hunter Education, you follow the prompts to register for the courses. Uh, I do wanna give everybody a heads up that if you're looking at getting a youngster into a Hunter Education course, our registration opens tomorrow, that's January 20th at 9 a.m. for our class that is going to be February 8th through, I'm trying to look at my little mini calendar behind me. 8th through the 12th. So the class is, is that week, registration tomorrow. And I just want you guys to be aware um, that the frustration is real to get into these virtual courses. And these classes are literally filling in seconds. And just because of the limited resources that we have to all offer virtual classes, um, people think, oh, it's virtual. You can have thousands of students at one time. That's not a reality, especially if we want to keep them um, a quality engaging experience for our students that are involved. And so we have to limit the amount of slots we open to the public based on the amount of instructors and manpower resources um, like laptops and, and Zoom accounts that we have available to, to offer these opportunities. So that's why they feel just astronomically fast. So, um, but I do want you to be aware that if, if you do have a youngster that is under the age of 10, there are opportunities for them um, through those virtual classes. And there's homework that they need to do, just like uh, they were gonna be coming to a classroom environment in a building. Um, this is where the homework lives. They can start this homework at any time. They, they download the manual for free. There's a worksheet available, especially now that we can't um, accept these like in-person hard copy paper. Um, they're a fillable PDF, so the students fill out their answers and then when they come they, before they come to class, they turn it in um, for admittance into that virtual environment. Um, and then of course, here's that quick place that you guys can check on available classes. As you can see, we've been offering virtual opportunities since July. And our, here's our next upcoming courses um, that are, are, are on the horizon. And as we are able to gather more instructors and put these classes on, this is where we post those opportunities. So check this frequently. I cannot stress that enough. Check this frequently. You can also check these um, courses and when um, registration opens on these days through your customer account as well. But typically all of our registration times are on, on the days at 9 a.m. So you're gonna wanna be in your account ready to go. And, and it's like, sadly, I'm sorry, ladies, it's like a lottery, but um, just be diligent, just be, just persevere and, and hopefully you can get in. The other thing I wanna throw out there is if you guys have that youngster that's under 10 and, and you've just tried every way in, in your power to get into a class, into a virtual class, and you're just, you're just unable and it's 
getting closer and closer to that deadline, please give one of the Hunter Education team a call, myself, Megan, or Rose, and we're gonna do our darndest to try to help you get that youngster um, into a, a course so, so they, can, they can hunt. Um, so, uh, Megan, I'll, I'll throw the baton to you. Anything else you wanna add in regards to our, our virtual courses? And, and I wanna say most of the folks that are um, from the staff um, have helped me <laughs> <laughs> repeatedly and I could not have done this without their help um, so uh, after Megan I mean Jessica you can chime in or Tristana but uh, Megan anything you want to add in regards to this virtual platform so just I guess a little explanation on, on the virtual course itself um, it looks pretty much similar to, to what you're seeing tonight um, we do it through the same platform of meetings um, you know we do require the students to be on camera cameras on um, you know, we meet in the evenings. Um, we'll go through through the curriculum like we would at a normal in-person class. So we'll go through, you know, the chapters. Um, a lot of our instructors are, are really good about um, incorporating, you know, some PowerPoints, some videos, uh, try to make it as interactive as we can with the students. Um, but this this is, you know, pretty much what it would look like. And, um, you know, the first, the first about half an hour or so might be a little rough for students, but they're all so used to, to doing this type of learning anyways. I mean, they've been doing this since, you know, last spring. So um, they pick it up pretty quickly. Um, you know, we try to, to keep as interactive as we can with the chat. Um, you know, we take a break uh, during, that, during the course. Um, each day we take a, a little break to let them stretch out and get some food and then come back. Um, but you know, it's it's still an in-person course. They're still seeing instructors. Um, we're still, you know, we're live. <laughs> we're answering questions. Um, so it, it's it's pretty similar to our in-person. We're we're there to help them learn through it. Um, most of our students they they adapted quickly and um, they start participating. They're asking questions in the chat. You know, they're using the signals of raising hands, thumbs up. We'll ask questions. Um, so we we've managed to get it pretty pretty interactive. Like Jennifer said, we've been doing it since July. So we, we worked out the kinks knowing that this was going to happen uh, more likely for us. So we, we started working on it pretty early to try to get a good, a good system down for these virtual courses. Um, you know, unfortunately, like Jennifer said, they are filling up very fast. Uh, you know, we're working on, on trying to get some more of those courses. Um, you know, it's, it's, we, we re rely a lot on volunteer instructors normally, even in our in-person courses. And so we're having to kind of switch gears and try to, you know, um, train our instructors to be able to do this type of teaching in this environment. And so it, we have a, you know, a big, big learning there, learning curve there for our instructors. And as we're getting more of them on board and comfortable with this, and we're able to start doing some more courses. But um, yeah, they do fill up pretty fast. So if, if you're interested in one, I wouldn't wait on, you know, oh well, we'll try to get one done in March or something like that, because that, that that's going to be pretty hard to do. Um, but other than that, they're fun. Us instructors, um, you know, we've, we've had to adapt to it and it's, it's given us a new challenge on how to teach these students. And, uh, you know, with every one we do, we, we learn a little bit and, uh, we're getting better and better at it, which is a good and a bad thing. We still miss seeing the students in person, you know, we enjoy the classes too. So, but at least we're, uh, we're able to, to see them like this and still give them, still give them that information so that they can you know, get out there and go hunting. Yep, ex exactly. And thanks for some of the messages and chats. And um, just in case other folks aren't able to see the chat, typically our, our virtual courses are in the late afternoons, early evenings. So after the kiddos are, are done either with their virtual class environment or they're back from the blended environment, which I see some schools are starting to utilize at this point. So normally it's a, it starts at 4.30. We give that 20, 30 minute break midstream. And then we normally wrap up by seven, 7.30 in the evening, Monday through Thursday. And then Friday we set up um, evaluation times, which is about 30 minute um, block of time. And we do actually do hands-on in these, this virtual environment. Obviously it's not hands-on um, by possibly me passing a firearm off to another student or passing something off to another student. Um, the students, uh, through Zoom are paired up with an instructor and we practice safe firearms handling um, through a, the Zoom platform. So the students will need to have some kind of either fire, unloaded firearm from their home under adult supervision or if they don't have that available to them, 
Um, they can have a broom or a mop handle, or if they've got a small BB gun, or if they've got some other kind of prop that they can utilize as a firearm for that practice time with the instructor so they can safely learn how to do the proper carries, uh, shooting positions, and the single and double person fence crossing. And of course, uh, making a fence. Um, everybody has chairs and some twine around their house, so that's typically their fence that we teach them how to cross an obstacle. So there's always ways to evolve uh, in, 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 so these students can learn these concepts that they can then take in the field. So there is a hands-on component. We also do in-class activities, daily, nightly homework, um, and then of course they're evaluated on their state firearms handling on that Friday with an instructor. Um, to ensure that they are under they are understanding how to handle a firearm safely in the field before they they move on to the final exam that is conducted online. So um, we try to make it an interactive like Mika said as much as we possibly can and we do breakout rooms so they're actually in smaller rooms with their peers doing ethical discussions and and so it's it's as close as we can get to an in-person environment as we possibly can um, amidst these challenges so um, hopefully, if you do have youngsters in, in your lives that you know, whether it's immediate family members, nieces, nephews, grandchildren, friends, neighbors, pass the word along to them. There seems to be quite a bit of confusion between the virtual and an online. So, so let them know that there are available classes for those under the age of 10 so we can get them what they need to um, continue or to actually start their enjoyment of actually being a hunter instead of maybe just tag al tagging along. So, and like I hey, mentioned, Jennifer, that homework, they can start at any time. Did somebody have something to oh, add? No, I was going to answer a question, but once you oh, don't. Okay. Go ahead. If there's something that we haven't touched on yet. So someone asked about um, the curriculum of the online compared to, to our virtual. And I saw that Jessica answered pretty good on it, but I just wanted to touch on it. So our our curriculum for our online courses. Um, one of the providers is actually the same provider of our student manual. So that curriculum follows almost identically. Um, the other two online courses, they all follow the standard curriculum that, like Jennifer said, all of the states um, accept. All of the states have uh, come together and agreed upon um, a standard curriculum that all hunter education classes will teach no matter what state you're in. So those other two online providers also, they, they teach that same standard curriculum. So, you know, compared to the, the virtual and the online, the curriculum's all gonna be the same. Um, the basic difference between those providers is just the way that they present it. Um, they, they've come up with different formats for that. Some, uh, some of the providers have gone with a, you know, here's what you need to finish type of, of scenario. But, you know, on the screen, it'll, you can click here, do this part, do this part. And then once you're done, you move on to the next chapter. Whereas other providers have done more of a, a traditional online, okay, you do this, click next, and it follows along that way. So that's the biggest difference with our online providers. And it's gonna uh, pretty much depend on what you're, uh, you know, what you're comfortable with or what you're, um, you know, you find is, is better for the student to, to go through. But the curriculums are all gonna be, uh, all be the same. It's teaching all of the same uh, concepts that we would teach even in the verbal course. Yeah, most definitely. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop my share here so I can see everybody. That's better. So, oh, just, oh, a quick, uh, just a quick follow up on that. So I have my 14 year old taking the online course, so he doesn't need to sign up for the virtual. He'll be good to go after that. Okay. Yeah, that is all he is required I, to do. He, he will be good to go. And, and we do have some parents, though, um, that have come to us or family members or even mentors. Um, maybe somebody's mentoring a child in their life that not, is not an immediate family member um, and, and, and want some more resources after that online education has, has occurred. And we're hoping, we're hoping that when we can all kind of return to more of an in-person, in-classroom, hands-on instructor, student environment that we're, we're hoping to, to offer some of these skills building to where, hey, maybe you've got your hunter education online and you're and, and you're looking for just a little bit more so as things as the world starts writing itself a little bit more be on the lookout for for additional educational opportunities but i do want to point out that the agency does have quite a bit of hunter education resources on the uh, department's youtube page so the the Perfect. students 
get that online um, education and, and they're still looking for more, they're still wanting to be engaged, uh, take a look at our department YouTube page and there's I think about 13 or 14 hunter education videos um, that we put out there that will recap a lot of what they've learned um, and might challenge them a little bit more um, and, and apply what they have learned in, in you know to to some of those activities that make some of those YouTube videos um, are offering so so that's another great resource um, to continue hunter education you know yep. after that yeah I mean one of the basics I was hoping that there is some sort of option where at some point he could get an in-person gun safety class as a follow-up just because he's doing it we don't have a gun in the house which I'm fine with but He's just like reading the handbook and it's a little different than actually handling something. So. Yeah, and then one thing that Jessica's program also offers is some um, um, hunting skills camps too. Uh, unfortunately, they're all in person, but I'll let Jessica touch on that a little bit. Okay. Um, Elizabeth, one thing that might help you out too is, um, did you say you're in Carlsbad? No, we're in Albuquerque. Oh, in Albuquerque, okay. Um, so there's, there's shooting ranges and um, several in, in Albuquerque and we do have a high school shotgun team that practices at the Albuquerque trap range there in the South Valley and all of those kids that participate in that program have to take hunter education and so they a lot of them take that online and then they go you know meet with their club and they're getting that hands-on reinforcement of that you know that safety because it's it's easy to watch, but it's once you get that firearm in your hands, then to really be you know cognizant of um, making sure you're pointing it in a safe direction and you're right. keeping your finger off the trigger, especially if he has played any video games at all. I mean, the instinct for those kids is to finger on the trigger and 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 you know we've noticed that sometimes their muzzle control is not as good because they're used to pointing the, 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 the video game gun at things. And so, um, but the Albuquerque Trap Club is one. And like Jennifer said, um, we've had, um, we've been trying in the past, been offering camps for families just like yours, uh, where you have a, a youth that's interested in hunting and, and you don't know the first thing about getting them out there and they take an online hunter ed course and then they come out and get some a real good hands-on um, training from us. We're hoping I'm hopeful maybe in the fall, we might be able to get back to doing that, but you know, it's it's kind of probably gonna be back when school, you know, is back in full swing, normal. Those like on the weekend or something? Yep, those are usually on the weekends. Um, and we do some through the summer, but they're usually a, a like a Friday evening to Sunday mid-afternoon kind of event, so. Yeah, I, this is totally random, but like, 20 years ago, I went to becoming an outdoor woman thing with, um, and that was actually kind of cool because they had gun safety and bows and, and they even did fishing. They did all sorts of stuff and you could do different classes. It was really actually pretty awesome. Yeah, so the becoming an outdoor woman is not functioning in New Mexico anymore. And um, Colleen, I don't know if she's still on. Nope, she's gotten off. Um, we, we've started a program with the Mule Deer Foundation. It's called Does. It's discovering the outdoors and encouraging sportsmanship. And uh, it's a ladies program, but we've kind of geared it kind of like the same as our, our youth programs where it's a field to fork um, kind of program where we're getting new families, new ladies out and teaching them. Basically, we're focusing more on a, on a skill like uh, today we're going to go pheasant hunting instead of uh, um, a wide variety of things. We will we'll do all the steps to go on a pheasant hunt. And, um, we, we did one last, well, I guess it's been, it wasn't last fall, it was the fall before. And, and we then cooked the pheasant right there. And that, that I think was a huge, oh, help to, um, the participants yeah. getting them engaged. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah it would be really nice if there was some sort of, um, Sorry. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, if there was some sort of family type camp, that would be really, I mean, we have friends who hunt and so that might, we might end up going with them, but, um, and I do lots of camping, but I've never done any hunting. So.
because I wouldn't even, you know, I don't know how to do any of cleaning or anything. Um, so. We'll definitely be on the lookout for, you know, as things start to, you know, get better, um, then we'll be able to start moving forward to start offering lots of skills based training um, in person uh, to fit those needs of folks just like you or potentially we have some folks that might have a little bit of experience under their belt, but are willing to learn more and wanting to learn more and, and gaining more skills. So just be on the lookout, everybody, for, for those uh, opportunities really just, as we're able to start offering those. I'm, so, I have to go feed these two giants. <laughs> um, so do they, would those be on the website or do you send out emails or how would we know if classes are coming up? We utilize multiple different communication platforms. So if you're part, if, if you have a customer a system with us, and even your, your boys, um, you'll get emails as long as you haven't opted that checkbox. So make sure you haven't opted out of the emails because if you have opted out of receiving emails, then you won't receive the emails from us. But if you're getting stuff like this from us, then you're probably going to get anything that the agency sends out to you. Uh, I know Tristana works really hard uh, on the social media platform with her and her staff, and they put out a lot of messages on, on Facebook, uh, Twitter, uh, Instagram, and we even have a TikTok page. So if you have your younger groups, um, be on the lookout for those. And then, of course, always on the website. Um, on that website I was showing you, we also have a tab over there that says camps, and, and Jessica posts stuff uh, as well there. So there's so many different avenues. but. If you want stuff like sent to you immediately, just check email and social media and uh, we, we put stuff there. So always be on the lookout for that, so. And if you don't get regular emails from us, um, like we send out a monthly update, shoot me an email or reply back to the one that I sent this evening and I will make sure and add you to those lists so that you you do get those. Um, and I think I have them. Yeah, <laughs> perfect. Yeah. Um, and a couple of other things, um, we do have a draw series that we are doing through um, through Zoom webinar and on Facebook Live. And so we've done a few sessions to help you in the application process. And so last week, Jennifer and I talked for over an hour about Hunter Education. Um, last week, we also did one on how to read the rules and information booklet, um, which is a good one. And then tomorrow, Ross, Morgan, and I are going to talk about, and we're going to actually go through the application process so you can see it live. Um, and ask questions. And so we have um, one, we have two this week, and then from this, from now on through end of March, we'll do one a week and talk about all the different species and answer questions and everything. So that's a use, useful tool in the short term until we can get back to in-person classes. Yeah, and especially if you, you're kind of intimidated by applying for a hunt, a hunt or purchasing a license, this is a great resource to do it and have it right there explaining to you the whole process to you live. So it'll be a great resource for you if you're able to join. Great. Okay, and, thanks. So, all right, I think I have to go and see the <laughs> Indian stuff. So. All right, <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, One of the things... Oh, uh, oh, go ahead, Jennifer. Oh, I was going to say that was pretty much a wrap up on the, on the Hunter Ed stuff. Um, but I do, because uh, I saw quite a bit or some in, uh, chat stuff on the mentor use. So I do want to touch on that before we'll jump off here so I don't go too terribly late. Um, but that's um, the other opportunity that's available. Uh, if, if you don't have the, if you, maybe, maybe your child just isn't quite ready for, for hunter education. And you're not really too sure if they're really going to like hunting or, you know, so there is the option of the mentor youth hunting program. I'm going to screen share this really quick again. Um, so you guys know where this resource lives. So same uh, department website right here uh, is Mentor Youth Hunting Program. You'll click there and it'll take you to that Mentor Youth Hunting page. And so this is basically, in a nutshell, it's a hunter education deferral program, a try before you buy um, and a families of field initiative. Um, and what this allows a youth to do is is try hunting under the direct supervision of an adult mentor for up to two consecutive license years prior to having hunter education. Uh, we have recently rolled back the minimum qualifying age for participation in mentor youth from 10 to now eight years of age. So anybody between eight and 17 years of age can participate as a mentor youth hunter. Uh, it is a tiered based program now. 
So for those youngsters eight and nine years of age, they can participate um, with a mentor under the Mentor Youth Program uh, for small game only, which is a great introductory species uh, for you know, a new hunter. And they can purchase that, that game hunting license only. They won't be able to apply for big game hunts if they're eight and nine unless they have hunter education. So that is the difference there. So this is a limited opportunity program, but it does provide an introduction opportunity for youth. Then once you turn 10, um, and you want to be involved in the mentor youth hunting program, then they can hunt big game species, but there is a limited list. So it's deer, javelina, pronghorn, turkey, and then also small game. So 10 to 17, you can actually hunt big game. If you're eight and nine years of age, you, you're limited to small game opportunities only. Uh, one of the things that I do wanna point out is in the fall, there are some youth only um, pheasant hunts on our, some of our wildlife areas that are a great uh, small game opportunity. So don't forget about that. Um, it'll be later on this year that youth can apply for those hunts. So essentially it's an either or hunting type of opportunity. You either take hunter education. Once you have hunter education, it supersedes this program. But if you're unable to get into hunter education, or maybe you're just not 100% sure your child is going to really enjoy hunting, or you just can't get in, this is one of those try before you buy. It's good for two consecutive license years. All the youth needs to do is just take a 25 question quiz to get a mentor youth number, and that will allow them to purchase a license and, and or apply for the, the species that are specific to those age categories. The other new thing that I want to point out right now is the mentor. So any adult that wants to take a mentor youth hunter afield has to also either have hunter education and or a mentor number. Um, this doesn't have to be done to apply for a hunt. It doesn't have to be done to purchase a license, but it must be done prior to taking that mentor youth afield. So that is another requirement that has been placed on the mentor um, this year. So, and that's a one, one and done thing as well. So if you have hunter education, then you don't need the mentor number. If you don't have hunter education, then you just need to go ahead and take that quiz. You'll get a mentor number, and then you can take that mentor youth afield and uh, for, for, the, for the hunt, and you can be their mentor. So, all of that, and it's a ton of information. I feel like I'm going kind of fast, but use the, the Game and Fish website as, as a great resource to kind of go back to and read up on um, the requirements to become a mentor youth, youth or a mentor for this program. And all the resources are available here as well. So check it out, um, kind of do, you know, dive in there and and um, if you don't quite remember what I said this evening, you can go back and, and utilize that. So uh, I do want to just point out though that that hunter education number or that mentor youth number needs to be in that child's account prior to that application deadline. You can't apply and then think retroactively, I can go in and take the course. It has to be done prior to that deadline or they won't be able to purchase a license and apply for those hunts. So make sure you plan ahead and any of these opportunities to, to have that child ready to go um, prior to those deadlines. So that's all I got, unless uh, a member of my team wanna kind of interject anything for the group before we sign off this evening, or if there's any questions in the chat that we need to address. seen any new questions pop up. Um, that was a lot of information, so thank you very much. <laughs> um, it's a whirlwind. <laughs> so if you, if you do have some questions afterwards, and um, we will get this posted up on the YouTube page as soon as we can. It, it takes a string of people to get it up there, but, but <laughs> we will get it up as soon as possible. And then, like I said, Jennifer and I talked last week on Facebook Live, and you can watch that video anytime. Um, and then Rosalind, Jennifer and Megan, all of their contact is listed on the Hunter Education page. So feel free to, to give them a call or Jennifer just posted that main Hunter Education line that you can call as well. 
Um, but next month, we have Nicole Tapman that will be joining us. She's one of Caitlin's colleagues, and um, she can talk about all kinds of different species that you can apply for in the draw, and we can answer draw-related questions. Um, if there are topics you want us to cover, make sure and shoot one of us an email or um, put it in the chat or call us or Facebook message us or whatever you want. But um, we would love to have ideas of what you guys would like us to talk about throughout the spring. Um, but I think that's it. It looks like everybody is ready for some dinner if you haven't eaten already. <laughs> but, I do want to point out that real quick, I added the main Hunter Ed number and our um, Hunter Ed email address to the chat. So it, you can reach us at those, those um, contact information if you have any questions. Or, you know, like I said, if you're really struggling to get that youth in a class and, and you're just, you just don't know what else to do, please give us a call and, and we'll do our best to try to help you out and find some resources. Cool. I think that's all we have. So we can say good night and we will see you all in February.